shown us who he is. Let us on Tuesday show him who we are. So we begin our coverage this morning live in Florida. John Roberts in Miami, where Trump holds the first of three rallies today. And John, good morning there. Bill, good morning to you. Uh, Donald Trump will be at the Bayfront Amphitheater right along the shores of Biscayne Bay at about noon today. This amphitheater holds 10,000 people, so if he can pack the place out, that is going to be a very good visual for him in terms of generating enthusiasm here in South Florida among voters. Here in Miami-Dade County, which is a very, very Democratic uh, county, he, he is uh, substantially behind in the early and absentee voting, but Republicans uh, in the overall ahead in the state of Florida. Let's put up the results of the latest ABC News tracking poll. 46-46 now. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump back to a tie. But take a look at this number because this is really interesting. The honesty and trustworthiness number, Donald Trump has got an eight-point lead, 46 to 38 over Hillary Clinton, indicating perhaps that the renewal of this email scandal may be taking a little bit of a bite out of her support. Uh, you mentioned uh, changing your vote. There are seven places across the United States where you can do that. The state of Wisconsin, where Donald Trump was last night. Michigan, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, New York, Connecticut, Mississippi. Mississippi, Minnesota, the deadline passed yesterday afternoon, New York and Mississippi, not really battleground states, so really Donald Trump focusing on people in the uh, three states of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Today, he'll continue to go hard against Hillary Clinton on the email scandal, this whole idea of corruption, particular drilling down on that email that was revealed yesterday from John Podesta, suggesting that he had to dump all of the emails. Here's what Trump said about that last night in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. We have to dump all of those emails. Can you believe this? That's WikiLeaks. And he also said, to me this made a big, a big statement, John Podesta, I tell you what, if he worked for me, I would fire him so fast. He is such a nasty guy. He would, I would fire him like The Apprentice. John, you're fired. Now, John Podesta insists when he used the word dump, he meant to give those documents over to investigators. Trump having none of that saying, though, that dump meant in the trash. Bill? In the, in the meantime, uh, many have pointed out that he's not taken the bait, um, whether it's a casting of the war on women, uh, however you want to phrase that appearance yesterday in Florida. Trump seems to be sticking on policy when it comes to Obamacare, et cetera. You heard that, John. Yeah, he has shown an extraordinary amount of discipline in the last week, just focusing on the FBI and the email investigation, as you said, not taking the bait and starting every rally with policy, specifically Obamacare, so because we're in open enrollment now. A lot of people are facing double-digit increases. Those astronomical deductibles are just crazy. Uh, Donald Trump vowed uh, yesterday again. Uh, in Valley Forge in a speech on policy to repeal and replace Obamacare, even upping the ante in how he will do it. Here's what he said yesterday in Valley Forge. I will ask Congress to convene a special session so we can repeal and replace. And it will be such an honor for me, for you, and for everybody in this country, because Obamacare has to be replaced. If we don't repeal and replace Obamacare, we will destroy American health care forever. He'll repeat that message this morning here in Miami, then uh, this afternoon in Orlando, this evening in Pensacola, and tomorrow morning in Jacksonville, Bill, as he spends a day and a half in this important battleground state. The big prize, really, among all the battlegrounds with 29 electoral votes. Yeah, right on. Thank you. John Roberts leading our coverage there. Thank you, John. Mark. So new developments in the Clinton email investigation. We are learning today that FBI Director James Comey and Attorney General Loretta Lynch, who have had some differences over how all of this has been handled, had a little meeting on Monday behind closed doors and discussed the case. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine yes. Herridge is live in Washington with the very latest on this. Catherine, good morning to you. Well, thank you, Martha. A government official has now confirmed that FBI Director James Comey and his boss, Attorney General Loretta Lynch, have met for the first time after his decision to reinitiate the Clinton email investigation. The official characterized the meeting as cordial with Lynch having confidence in the FBI's review of these new documents. Though a former Justice Department official told Fox News that it's significant, Lynch did not block Comey's decision to reinitiate the case, and it probably goes back to her tarmac meeting in Arizona last June with Bill Clinton, just one week before Hillary Clinton's FBI interview. 
when Director Comey advised her that he was planning on making this statement, she didn't feel confident enough to give him a direct order not to do it. Why didn't she? My guess is because she realized that her involvement in this had been compromised by her meeting with Bill Clinton on that plane. The Attorney General has an event here in Washington on a separate subject, but Fox News is going to try and get some questions to her about the reopening of the email case and whether she fully backed that decision uh, after her meeting uh, Monday yeah. with uh, Director Comey Martha. I look forward to that. So, Catherine, the FBI also out yesterday with some new information that may have caught the Clinton team a bit off guard, right? Well, look, the FBI's position on these records is that the Bureau releases new, new documents when they're ready, and the Bureau has an obligation when there are multiple requests for the records through the Freedom of Information Act, and that was the case here with the rich documents. So they're saying it's not calculated. It, timing is simply the timing. So those who have not been following this closely, just yesterday the FBI vault, was, which is where these records are posted online, they're heavily redacted, though. They tweeted out the fact that they were available, and this certainly alerted the media to the records and seemed to have caught the Clinton campaign off guard. There are 129 heavily redacted pages in this new release, and they're heavily redacted for privacy reasons. And it's about the controversial pardon of Mark Rich in 2001 by President Bill Clinton. Rich had faced tax evasion charges, and he had fled to Switzerland and ultimately was pardoned, and critics said or at least pointed out his wife was this major donor to the Democratic Party. So he died in 2013, but the controversy has lived on, and critics say it's another piece of evidence of this sort of pay-for-play mentality uh, by the Clintons, Martha. Yeah. All right. Catherine, thank you very much. Let's You're analyze welcome. now. Chris Starwald, our Fox News digital policy editor, is working on that playbook right now. Chris, how you doing? Um, Living the dream, brother. Generally speaking, did, did you on day seven yesterday, seven days away, meaning from the election, did you pick up a sense of a shift in this race? When you look at the, the number of polls that have been out in the last 48 hours, and whether they're right or wrong, whether they're up or down, uh, you watch your Twitter feed from mainstream media, and you get a sense that that the map is changing. Uh, do you agree with that, A, and is that for real? Well, I, would, I might look at it a little bit differently. Uh, we had seen the race closing over the past two or three weeks. Uh, Donald Trump was at an unnaturally low point, uh, and he, it had been a very bad run for him. Uh, and we saw the race normalizing. And as we were going into last Friday, when the news broke about Tony Weiner's laptop, uh, that things had already normalized in the race. The race had gone back to where it was, which was a small but fairly steady lead for Hillary Clinton. Now we get into this week, and part of what you're seeing out there are reporters, analysts, and others who... <clears throat> the polls are usually right, but not every poll in unto itself is correct. So when people see a 13-point swing or they see this up or that down, they freak out. And part of what you're seeing this week are people who thought once that the race was way out of whack and that Donald Trump had no mm -hmm. chance, realizing that, yeah, in fact, he has a chance to win this. Um, the headlines, Obamacare increases, he's hitting that. FBI investigation, that's all over the place. Trump has not taken the bait, as you heard me talk with John Roberts right. a moment ago. Uh, yesterday, between President Obama and Hillary Clinton, it was back to the war on women, uh, characterized in a different way. And for Trump, it was the war on Obamacare. And you study some of this early voting, and you can see good news for her among Hispanics in Florida. You can mm -hmm. also see bad news for her among African Americans from Florida and mm -hmm. in, in North Carolina, and perhaps elsewhere. We'll wait to see on that. But if you were expecting to see the African-American turnout in 2016, the way it had been, the last two presidential cycles, you might have been kidding yourself a little bit because it has not been there so far. Right. By volume, it, sh it won't be. Uh, and I don't think anybody would expect uh, to see African-American voters turn out in the same number uh, that they did for the first African-American president. That sort of stands to reason. Uh, the question is, how much does it, does it fall off? And that's also the question for her with millennial voters. How much does it fall off? What she's counting on is that she's going to do really well with suburban women. She's going to do really well with white women with college degrees. And she hopes that that'll be enough to offset. Thank you, brother. You betcha. I'm looking for your email. <clears throat> it's going to be good, man. Get back to work. Got to wait for midday. Half time. Half time report. <laughs> Thank you, Chris.
All right, so the clock is ticking, and we're going to be covering every move that the candidates make through Election Day. And be sure to keep it here, right, because this is the only place to be. November 8th, comprehensive election coverage that you literally cannot find anywhere else, and we will be on it. We're starting at, like, 4 in the morning mm -hmm. uh, and going basically all through the 24-hour, uh, 48-hour cycle waiting for it. 15, around the old election. It's been a long 15 months, hasn't it, McCallum? It, it, really? I noticed. <laughs> President Obama slamming Donald Trump. He said this yesterday in Columbus, Ohio. If you disrespected women before you were elected, you will disrespect women once you're president. So how will that influence female voters? Laura Trump, the wife of Donald Trump's son, Eric, will join us in a moment here. We'll talk to her about all that. And what is happening inside the FBI, where the Clinton email investigation may be headed? House Homeland Security Committee Chairman Michael McCall will be here on that. Also, as that controversy continues, the dog, the Clinton campaign, its Trump's nickname, Crooked Hillary starting to stick with voters. She had a private foundation that took foreign contributions and has come out in this avalanche of emails. I, I truly do believe uh, convinces millions of Americans that Hillary Clinton should never be elected president of the United States. I had agreed to keep cases connected to Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump quiet over the summer because of the approaching election. Those cases focusing on Trump's former campaign manager and the Clinton Foundation and Texas Congressman Mike McCall, <laughs> chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee. Sir, how are you? And good morning to you. And thank you for coming back Do here well, on America's thanks. Newsroom. What is your sense about what's happening within the FBI now with regards to the Clinton Foundation, a story that was largely buried given the news of Anthony Weiner's laptop on Friday? Well, I know there is an ongoing investigation. The uh, director in congressional testimony uh, indicated uh, that. And so I think, you know, on, on those two unrelated to the email investigations, it is a normal practice. I worked at the Justice Department uh, not to uh, indict just right before an election. I think in the email case, it's a unique case uh, because it you know came out of a congressional investigation. And Jim Comey, when he testified before Congress, uh, told us that if new evidence developed in the case that this case that had been completed uh, would be reopened. So he simply gave us an update uh, as he promised he would do so. Mm -hmm. Okay, you say it's unique, but in, in what other sense would that be? Okay, so it comes out of Congress. What, how significant would that be as opposed to a private citizen that would bring in information? Because of the nature of the case, the fact that he came before Congress and told us that if new evidence arose, he would update us uh, on the case. Uh, Mrs. Clinton has been running around saying she's been cleared uh, and the investigation is over, when in fact that is not a correct statement. Uh, there is now a new evidence uh, reopening the case uh, and evidence that could be quite damaging. Remember, to get a search warrant, you have to have probable cause, uh -huh. and they had probable cause to get a search warrant for these emails on Huma Abedin's laptop. If she wins, Next Tuesday, what happens to that investigation? Well, that's uh, something I've been talking about that hasn't been mentioned very much, and that is this investigation will continue uh, whether she wins or not. But assuming she wins uh, and the investigation goes forward and it looks like an indictment is pending, at that point in time under the Constitution, uh, the House of Representatives would uh, engage in an impeachment trial. They would go to the Senate. And impeachment proceedings and removal would take place. Uh, remember, this the only last time I can recall when this happened was Richard Nixon, uh, who was impeached uh, and resigned before he would have been voted to remove office. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, remember, uh, Gerald Ford pardoned uh, him from any criminal wrongdoing. Uh, I would hate to see this country being thrown into a constitutional crisis because of Hillary Clinton's behavior. Okay, now we, um, we have talked to you quite often for various investigations on Homeland Security, et cetera. But you are six days away from a national election and you've used the I word. Um, uh, you wanna take that back? I'm sorry, the I word. Impeachment. Impeachment. I, again, I think with the new emails, if they're classified information, particularly emails that could you have intent uh, in, in those emails. We saw Podesta's 
uh, WikiLeaks uh, email saying to dump all these emails, that's getting a little closer uh, to intent. If we see an email that says, I know that's classified, but send it anyway, that would be the kind of smoking gun the FBI is looking for. That then, I think, would be the grounds for an indictment. I've said all along, Bill, that this should have gone before a grand jury uh, to take the politics out of this. This would not be a, a, a unique case to go before a grand jury, as I've done many times uh, in the past. For whatever reason, they chose not to do that. I think there's ample evidence with the probable cause to get the search warrant now to go before the grand jury and present this new evidence. Wow. Mike McCall from Texas, sir. Thank you for coming back today. Strong stuff. Thanks a lot, Bill. 21 path. Right future. And I say we, we, it's we. I'm a messenger. I'm only a messenger, remember. I'm only a messenger, but you have to say I'm doing a pretty good job as a messenger. Yeah. But I'm the messenger. He's the messenger, he says. Donald Trump yesterday touting himself as the candidate of change. This says the electoral map gets quite a bit tighter. The latest Fox News scorecard shows Hillary Clinton with enough electoral votes to win based on where the polls are right now. But her lead is shrinking by the day. So let's bring in Kristen Solstice Anderson, Washington Examiner columnist and a Republican pollster uh, for her take on this. Kristen, welcome. Good to have you Thank here you today. Um, first of all, just quick take on how the electoral map is changing. It's certainly better to be Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump at this point, but Donald Trump, the polls are trending a little bit his way. This race is tightening. The last couple of days of news cycles have not been great for the Clinton campaign. Stories that should have been bad for Trump have not really done damage to him that much. Uh, so it's at this point, the momentum is behind Trump, although he's got a long way to go to make up ground. Yeah, and only six days to do it in. Let's take a look at some of the states individually here. Uh, first up, we have a look at the RCP average of the polls in Florida. Um, you see Donald Trump at 45.5. She's at 44.5. How do you characterize this race right now, Kristen? The race in Florida is very tight, in part because you have two big competing constituencies that both candidates are doing well with. On the one hand, Florida has a growing Latino population. Hillary Clinton does very well with those voters. But you've also got a lot of folks who are white voters, retired, living in sort of the northern part of the state that is prime Trump country. So this is really a clash of both of their demographic bases uh, coming to a head in one state. And Trump has consistently had uh, a very slight advantage in Florida compared to other states states with large Latino populations. Yeah. President Obama headed there um, as they bring out the big guns in the tight race that's going on in Florida. So let's take a look at Nevada, which looked, um, you know, just days ago to be lost for Donald Trump, um, is now very tight as well. You're right. Uh, and Nevada is one of those states where, again, Donald Trump has a big hotel with his name on it. Uh, it's the sort of state where, you know, he really came to play and has always believed that it's on the table for him. And in Nevada, Republicans actually have a chance at picking up a Senate seat there. So you have a little bit of, of good stuff going on in the down ballot race that has the potential to perhaps help make this a, a more right pickup for Republicans. All right. North Carolina, very tricky. Um, and Hillary Clinton has been ahead for the most part in North Carolina. But now you see the latest poll has 47-46, uh, well within the margin of error in North Carolina. How does that one look to you? North Carolina is a state where down ballot is less good for Republicans, especially at the governor's race, because there's been a lot of controversy there over issues like the transgender bathroom bill, voter ID. So there's a lot going on in North Carolina that's different from the national debate. There, Donald Trump has always struggled. But one thing he may have going for him, New York Times today is reporting that African-American early vote turnout appears to be slightly down in places like North mm -hmm. Carolina. So the Clinton campaign would really need to ramp that up in order to catch up uh, and make sure that they've got that state banked in their column. Yeah. They've limited the early voting days uh, in North Carolina, mm -hmm. which has been controversial. Some say it's right. making it harder for black voters to get to those voting places uh, in their areas. Christian, thank you very much. Interesting read. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Martha. Look at the big board this morning. Stocks open in one minute. Right now, investors blaming slumping stocks on a nearing election and tightening polls. How about that? Some say if Trump wins, stocks drop due to uncertainty. Mm. Also, watch the Fed interest rate update this afternoon. So stand by. Lots to that. watch on Wall Street with regard to this election. And an all-out manhunt underway in Iowa 
after the ambush killings of two police officers who were on duty just sitting in their squad cars. It's a horrific story out of Iowa this morning, and we have the very latest on the developments. Also, Hillary Clinton attempting to pivot from her email scandal and back to the so-called war on women. Reaction from a member of the Trump family next. Nobody respects women more than Donald Trump. I'll tell you, nobody, nobody. Nobody respects women more. And my, my daughter, Ivanka, always says, Daddy, nobody respects women more than you, Daddy. So the race is getting tighter by the minute. The Clinton campaign is starting to revive the attacks on Donald Trump and his treatment of women. Hillary Clinton hit the trail yesterday. She was in Florida, and she did not hold back. He thinks belittling women makes him a bigger man. And I don't think there's a woman anywhere who doesn't know what that feels like. He doesn't see us as full human beings with our own dreams, our own purposes, our own capabilities. And he has shown that clearly throughout this campaign. So that was on the trail yesterday. That was Hillary Clinton. Joining me now is Laura Trump. She is the wife of Donald Trump's son, Eric. Laura, great to have you here. Good morning to you. Good morning, Martha. So when you, when you hear that, when you hear Hillary Clinton uh, saying those things about your father-in-law, and when you look at what's happened over the last couple of months with regard to that, what goes through your mind? Well, I actually saw yesterday uh, when Hillary Clinton was talking, and actually the first thing I thought was, it's a really sad attempt to distract voters from what we all see coming out these days about Hillary Clinton. You know, she's got big, big problems on her hands. Um, we've seen all the WikiLeaks emails come out. Now there's this new revived FBI investigation. I think she knows she's in serious trouble. And whenever she isn't talking about the issues that matter to voters, when she's trying to attack Donald Trump on women and bringing out Alicia Machado, to me, it was a very, very obvious way to distract voters away from the real problems that she's having. So you represent a couple of categories where Hillary Clinton is doing well, actually. She's doing well with women. She's doing well with young women uh, in particular. And she's doing better than your father-in-law in those categories. Why do you think that is? Well, look, I, I don't fully uh, believe all that because I have to tell you, I, I'm on the ground and I, I'm seeing voters and I'm seeing women. And I've been lucky enough to travel around the country with a group of women that know Donald Trump. And you know what? We get women coming out all the time saying, we have so many women that are supporting your father-in-law. Don't believe what you're hearing out there. You know, I think there are a lot of women that are scared to say that they're supporting my father-in-law. And, and I actually think that the numbers on November 8th are going to reflect that, that that people, men and women alike, are sick of what's been going on in this country. They're ready for change, and they're going to vote for Donald Trump. Do you think that women are sympathetic to the idea that, that it would be significant, historic, to elect the first women president? Or do you think younger women don't care as much about that? I think that we will see a woman be president of this country one day. I certainly hope that woman is not Hillary Clinton. You know, it, it's a little ridiculous uh, to think that anyone would vote for someone because of their gender. And, and I think that women actually find that a little insulting. We should put the best person in office for this country that's going to do the best job for all Americans, m man or woman. You know, and the, the idea that anyone would vote for a candidate simply because of their gender is, is a little ridiculous to me, quite frankly. And I hear it from voters all the time. You know, women come up to me and say that, that, you know, we understand that there's a history being made here, but we don't want it to be made with Hillary Clinton. Interesting. You know, I just want to ask you a question about your family and what you think when the possibility of a White House life for the next four years dawns on all of you. Is that... Is it daunting to some extent? Well, you know, to be honest with you, Martha, I think we're all sort of taking this in, in step by step, day by day. Uh, and we haven't really wrapped our, our minds around that. But what I do know is that, look, this, this hasn't been an easy 18 months for our family. It's been very tough. Um, but we all are doing this because we know that America needs change. And, and I'm very confident in my father-in-law, Donald Trump. I know he's going to do an incredible job for this country. He's the only person that I know can turn this country back around. When we have 95 million Americans out of the workforce, when we have national security issues, you know, our educational system ranked 30th in the world, we need 
need big, big changes to be made. We need to clean out Washington, D.C., because it's not working for the people. And I know that my father-in-law is going to do that. So mm -hmm. as, as daunting as it might be, I think we all know that, um, that it's for the betterment of our country. All right. Any political future for your husband or for you that you see? <laughs> I think we'll all need to cool off quite a bit after this uh, election cycle before we even think of that. Well, you guys all came into this uh, with no political background, but you've been uh, very strong spokespeople on behalf of, of your father-in-law and in their case of their father. I think everybody would say that on both sides of the aisle. Lara, very good to talk to you today. I know you're in North Carolina, which is a tight race, uh, and we'll see you next time. Many thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Martha. Do you think that she is a corrupt person? Well, I, I don't think there's any question that over the last 30 years, the, the Clintons' careers have been characterized by no, but her, the, Hillary Clinton. the politics is she, is she of personal encroachment. Is she corrupt? I think that, well, I think there's been outright corruption represented throughout their careers. That's just that's the kind of pay-to-play corruption the American people are right. tired of in Washington, well, D.C. There's Mike Pence from last night with O'Reilly making the case against Hillary Clinton. The daily WikiLeaks dump, the new emails being looked at by the FBI, uh, the Clinton Foundation. Are they taking their toll on Hillary Clinton in the polls? Brad Blakeman, former Deputy Assistant President George W. Bush. Jessica Tarloff, Democratic pollster, a senior political strategist for Shone Consulting. And good day to both of you. Good morning. Trump's called her crooked from the beginning, Brad. Is that, are you seeing that being reflected now? I think you absolutely are. And the fact that the FBI announced that their investigation continues into Hillary Clinton uh, tells you that everything Donald Trump has said before is true. And we don't have to look much further than the prior Clinton administration that was plagued by scandal and corruption and impeachment. So if the American people liked scandal and corruption in their prior presidential Clinton experience, then they're going to love it next time because it's not going to be over by Election Day. The FBI investigation continues, along with a myriad of other congressional investigations that have not finished. Now, Jessica, is she vulnerable to this charge? Oh, I definitely think she is, and she has been throughout this campaign. We just saw in the latest ABC Washington Post tracker poll that Donald Trump now has an 8% lead in honesty and trustworthiness over her, which I find astounding when you look at the actual level or number of lies that either candidate has told. Um, I think it's been incredibly effective. I think Mike Pence is showing, though, a little bit of his discomfort with name-calling, which he's talked about before, and, you know, Donald Trump would go right for it and say, of course, you know, crooked Hillary, corrupt Hillary, and Pence is dancing a little bit. Um, but I think that it's a very strong argument. I, I don't happen to think that it's true, but it's obviously been effective. But I do think that the Democrats as well have made the case on the other side, talking about the number of people Donald Trump has stiffed, you know, the number of contractors he hasn't paid, you know, his treatment of women, which Martha was talking about in the last segment, things that are huge character flaws and business professional flaws with Donald Trump that I think has hurt him, too. Well, in a campaign like this, it seems like that charge would level a lifetime ago. <laughs> oh, my God. I know, but I'm hoping for more this week. Okay, well, so <laughs> we'll, we'll, well, we'll see. I'm sure you do um, yeah. uh, from your perspective. Okay. But Pence did not take the bait last night from O'Reilly, Brad. And if you think about Trump's message going after Obamacare, while Hillary Clinton has Miss Universe in Miami, Florida yesterday, and it was almost a revival, and, and President Obama, for that matter, was in Columbus, Ohio with a similar message. It was almost like they've revived the war on women under a very different phrase four years later. They, they have, but it's not working. It's desperation. Uh, the American people are getting their Obamacare notices, and so they're affected when they reach their mailbox and see that their premiums are skyrocketing when they were promised that their premiums would go down. They promised they would have more choice. So I think the issues are going to turn this election and not the scandal on, uh, with regard to Donald Trump because it's more amorphic. The fact is the FBI is investigating Hillary Clinton. The FBI is not investigating Donald Trump. And when you talk about stiffing workers, Donald mm -hmm. Trump has had a myriad hundreds, thousands of deals. Of course he's going to have lawsuits and, and discrepancies <laughs> and disputes. That's what business is all about. You know, with, it, this I is mean, the difference. Let, let, let me just, let Donald let Trump's me, let me, record let me just, with success just against wanna, Hillary's record it. of failure. Um, Jessica, listen to the first half of his answer there. Mm -hmm. Does Trump make a more convincing case for change in America for those voters that are looking for it? 
I think that he has by at least saying, I'm not a politician, which is where we started with this election. You know, 55% of Americans want change. 65 say we're on the wrong track, though, you know, high 50s like President Obama, which indicates that they're, you know, they don't have as much of a problem with what's going on here. But yes, I think Brad's right, you know, hammering Obamacare, talking about wage growth but not enough, uh, what kind of boost to the economy you can provide, they're all good things. But for Brad to discount the Trump scandals, which have obviously hurt him, and especially with women. I mean, you talk about this. This man is not doing well with the ladies. You know, and every state that has high female turnout for early voting is showing a push towards Hillary Clinton. So I, I don't think that that, that okay. part of the argument is fair. But I think that he has done as well as he can with this. I don't think he's a particularly gifted one-on-one -on -one candidate. I think he did well or better in the primaries than he has in the general election year when he had a lot of people okay. to surround himself with. But, uh, Listen, Donald Trump is doing better than I expected him to, for oh. sure. Six days to go. Thank you, Jessica. Oh, my God, I know. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Thanks. Bye, guys. Percent. Amazing, right? Let's bring in David Bossie, Deputy Campaign Manager for the Trump Pence Campaign. David, welcome. Good morning to you. Good to have oh, you here. Thanks for having me, Martha. Oh, so, you know, just looking at some of the stories this morning in uh, the newspapers and such. Uh, the Washington Post says that your candidate is showing, quote, flashes of a cohesive closing argument and that he is uncharacteristically disciplined in his speech as he calls again for the eradication of the Affordable Care Act. Um, what's the tone of the campaign right now, Donald Trump? You know, Mr. Mr. Trump's been doing this all along. He, he's bringing to the American people a positive message of change, and that's really what this whole campaign's been about. And Mr. Trump's out there talking about the the, the important issues that are uh, that are vital to everyday Americans' lives and, and their families, whether it's education or jobs or the trade bad trade policies or, yeah. or fixing uh, Obamacare. I hear what you're saying, but you know what they're picking up on is is a discipline that we have not always seen from the Trump campaign. We saw Alicia Machado out on the stage yesterday. That could be Hillary Clinton trying to bait him into some sort of response that will make the news cycle more about him. Uh, how are you keeping the candidate as disciplined as he's been in recent days and can he keep it up? You know, Hillary Clinton's fear tactics are, are desperate. Uh, we, we feel it. We feel what she is doing is is trying to finish this campaign on a negative uh, fear fear mongering uh, uh, message. And we're we're delivering the exact opposite. Mr. Trump's out there with a hope, growth and opportunity message. Uh, and so we're 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 excited that Americans are going to be able to make that decision on Tuesday. You know, there were lots of reports in the recent you know, last couple of weeks, I would say that that there was a lot of down mood at the Trump campaign that that, you know, you guys had a feeling that it was not going to go your way. Uh, that's changed a little bit since Friday, I would imagine. Um, you know, how do you how do you keep that momentum going? And when you look at the data, which does show early voting leaning towards Democrats and that he's still having a very tough time with women voters, how do you try to close that gap? You know, we're really excited with the with the trends, Martha, the the early absentee ballot and the early vote numbers in Florida, North Carolina, Ohio and Iowa, which is our pathway to victory, are incredibly strong. Uh, we are performing well uh, with women. We're overperforming with men. Uh, the demographic groups are breaking, you know, in our favor at every age group. Uh, we're we're excited because the American not, people I mean, are we're recognizing. Not, we're not seeing that, they're to be honest. You know, when you look no, no, at, at the no, no, women, you're not hold seeing, on, David. I mean, you can say you're winning yeah. with every group, and you know that may turn out to be true on November eighth. But when you look at the data uh, so far, it, it looks like the early vote is leaning Democratic. When you look at Hispanics and women in Florida, for example, they continue yeah. to be very strong for Hillary Clinton. So I'm asking you, strategically, how are you going to overcome that deficit? Yeah, Martha, actually, l let's just talk about uh, North Carolina for a, a specific example. Uh, we are overperforming Mitt Romney's 2012 numbers by 30,000 votes, and the Democrats are underperforming by about 75,000 votes. So that's a 100,000 vote swing to our favor in ballots cast. And Mitt Romney won that state by 77,000 votes. So we, he was going into Election Day over 300,000 votes down in early voting, and he won by 77,000. I hear what you're saying. I, we I mean, are 100, we, so they, those are real numbers. Those aren't polls. Those are real ballots cast. 
So, you know, just looking at our electoral scorecard, which our decision team, you know, re does basically every day. There's the scorecard. Hillary Clinton at 287, Donald Trump at 174. Yeah. We just moved, our folks just moved North Carolina, in fact, to from toss-up to leaning Democrat. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're seeing something very different on the ground in North Carolina than you are. Yeah, they're fundamentally flawed in whatever they're looking at, Martha. They should give me a call. <laughs> I'd be happy to walk them through it. All right. So they're President gonna, Obama They're going to find is, out on election, on election exactly. day, Martha. There's only one, one poll left that really matters, and that was going to happen that, in that's six right, days. That's right. And uh, we're going to win it. We're winning North Carolina on election day. It's pretty clear that, that President Obama wants to reignite the war on women. He was out yesterday in Ohio uh, talking to voters on the campaign trail. He said, look. Gentlemen, guys, I'm paraphrasing him. Um, if you are having trouble voting for a woman, if that's a bit of a hurdle for you to get over, um, you need to get over it. You need to be okay with voting for a woman. What do you think about that? N not very much, Martha. That's not exactly a closing message for a campaign. Uh, if, if Hillary Clinton's message uh, is one of fear and Barack Obama's is one of, uh, you know, uh, trying to get over voting for a woman, which is a ridiculous argument, uh, they have nothing to, to get people to motivate uh, them to turn out on Election Day. And that's what we see fundamentally across the country with our enthusiasm, the army of Trump, those vo those volunteers that are out knocking on doors, making the phone calls, those people by the tens of thousands showing up at Trump rallies across the country is overwhelming. And she is just having trouble with the enthusiasm. That enthusiasm gap is going to be the story next Wednesday. We will see. David, thanks for your time. We'll see you next time. Thanks for having me. Now yeah. to the other side. Hillary Clinton travels to Nevada and Arizona today. A victory in Arizona would be a huge win for Democrats, clearly. They have not carried that state since 1996. Rich Edson is live, starting his day in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where Hillary Clinton campaigned yesterday. And what's the strategy now where you are today? Rich, take it a day at a time. Yeah, good morning, Bill. And the strategy here is to show up and slam Donald Trump. She has had several appearances in Florida over the past week. A campaign official says they believe if Hillary Clinton can win here in Florida, she closes off every conceivable path for Donald Trump to become president of the United States. Three events yesterday, the first in the Tampa area, second in the Orlando area. She ended up here last night in Fort Lauderdale. She has had a two-pronged approach against Donald Trump. The first is to attack him on women, saying that he's abusive towards women and not a very good role model for women or girls. She brought out uh, the former Miss Universe, Alicia Machado. Remember, it was Clinton who brought Machado into the national conversation, bringing up her case during one of the debates, claiming that she'd been verbally abused by Donald Trump. The second part of that attack is to go after him as being erratic, someone who is dangerous, and someone who should not have control of the U.S. military or nuclear codes. Here's Hillary Clinton during one of her rallies yesterday after a Trump supporter interrupted her. I am sick and tired of the negative, dark, divisive, dangerous vision and behavior of people who support Donald Trump. It is time for us to say no. We are not going backwards. We're going forward into a brighter future. And an unusual schedule for her from here for a Democratic candidate, Arizona, where Republicans usually win, and then later this week, Detroit, which has been solidly, at least Michigan, solidly Democratic for some time. Bill, back to you. The guy, the Bureau, releasing 129 pages of documents from the 2001 investigation into President Bill Clinton's pardon of financier Mark Rich, which was a huge story at the time, not something most people have heard about in between. It was very controversial. Rich's ex-wife was a very big Democratic donor and spent lots of time visiting the White House for dinners and social events and that kind of thing. Denise Rich is her name. So Mark Thiessen joins us now, columnist for The Washington Post, Fox News contributor and a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Good to see you this morning, Mark. Um, Good to see you, Martha. First of all, uh, tell everybody who Mark Rich is and why this uh, revelation of these documents would matter. 
Well, Mark Rich was a Clinton confidant who was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list because he had a habit of trading with regimes that were under U.S. sanctions. So he, he get traded, was caught trading with Iran at the very same time in 1979 when they held 53 American hostages. He traded with the apartheid regime in South Africa. He traded with Libya and Yugoslavia and North Korea and Cuba and the Soviet Union. And so he was facing life in prison for racketeering, tax evasion, and trading with the enemy. But as you pointed out, Denise Rich was a major Democratic donor, gave more more than a million dollars to Democratic uh, campaigns during the Clinton era, almost half a million dollars to the Clinton Library. And so on his final day in office, in a very controversial move, Bill Clinton, uh, over, over Justice Department objections, pardoned Mark Rich, which is very unusual because usually a presidential pardon goes to someone who's, who's paid their debt to society, who's changed their lives. Mark yeah. Rich was a fugitive from justice. This had never been done before. And so it was hugely controversial at the time. So the Clinton campaign says this is not coincidence that the FBI decided to release these documents with six days to go. You know that they're very rankled. They think the FBI is basically after them, given uh, Comey's decision last Friday. Do they have a point? Well, you know, the, interestingly enough, the guy, these are, this is into the investigation, these are documents into the investigation of whether criminal charges should have been brought against the Clintons for the, for the pardon, and they decided not to bring charges, and the prosecutor who decided not to bring charges was James Comey. So it's kind of hard to say that this is somehow an anti-Clinton move. They also gave in documents about Trump, uh, by Fred Trump, father, uh, Donald Trump's fathers at the same time. So this is not, this is just a, this is a routine FOIA request. But why it's relevant to this election, and why they should be worried, is that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton have continued to enrich themselves in the years past from their connections with Mark Rich associates. For example, one of Mark Rich's uh, associates was a guy named Gilbert Chiguri. He would, they traded oil together in the in the uh, international oil markets. Gilbert Chiguri was denied entry into the United States for terrorist ties with Hezbollah. He was convicted of money laundering for plundering the asset, oil assets of Nigeria in Switzerland, and he was a major Clinton Foundation donor. gave a billion, pledged a billion dollars to the Clinton. Global Initiative, uh, was invited to Bill Clinton's 60th birthday, and while she was Secretary of State, her State Department was negotiating with him to buy his land for a U.S. consulate in Nigeria using taxpayer dollars. So they were doing business with a convicted money launderer with ties to terrorists who was a Mark Rich associate. So they have continued to enrich themselves through their connections to the Mark Rich uh, you know, shady universe. Fascinating. Uh, one, one final question for you. There are reports that George P. Bush, the nephew of the 43rd president of the United States, says that potentially uh, 41 and 43 could vote for Hillary Clinton in this election. What's your response to that? Um, I don't know if, uh, if they will vote for Hillary Clinton. I can certainly understand why they wouldn't vote for Donald Trump. I mean, if you recall back into the, in the uh, South Carolina Republican debate, Donald Trump stood on this debate stage and said to the American people that George W. Bush lied to them about, about uh, weapons of mass destruction, that he knew about 9-11 before it happened and failed to stop it. He basically spouted all the far-left conspiracy theories about, about uh, that had been in charge. I was in the White House in the Bush administration, Martha, and we used to hear people chanting outside, banging drums chanting Bush lied and people died. They heard Donald Trump say that from a Republican debate stage. So I'm not surprised at all that George W. Bush or, or his father are not voting for Donald Trump. If Donald Trump loses this election, you know, the never Trumpers will say, see, we told you so. And what happens to the Republican Party and what happens to that group of, of people? Well, I, I think that if you, there's going to be, first of all, I don't know that he's going to lose. I think he could win. He's getting closer and the election's getting tighter. So uh, I, I'm not willing to concede yet that Donald Trump is going to lose the election. But if he loses, he will have lost a perfectly winnable election. Hillary Clinton is the weakest Democratic nominee to come forth uh, in, in, in my lifetime. Uh, there is no reason. If you look at that field of Republican candidates, can you imagine if Marco Rubio was the nominee right now or Scott Walker or, or even Mike Pence was the nominee? They would be crushed. Hillary Clinton. So if we lose this election, it will not be because of the never Trumpers. It'll be because the Republican Party nominated the weakest candidate they could possibly put up against Hillary Clinton. We'll see. Mark Thiessen, always good to talk to you. Thanks for coming by. Thank you, Martha. More WikiLeaks now uncovering emails that point to a possible conflict of interest between the Clinton campaign and a top official of the Justice Department. Ed Henry's reading your emails again today. He's live in Washington. How you doing, Ed? Good to see uh, you. Right, another day. It's 1025 on the East Coast. What are you finding? Well, look, uh, the, uh, Huma Abedin's, uh, the investigation of her laptop and these new emails is obviously dominating uh, the political conversation. And part of that conversation is in previous WikiLeaks dumps, we've seen John Podesta just 
you know, lauding and lauding an official at the Justice Department. You see him there, Peter Kadzik, uh, a deputy assistant attorney general. He's in charge of congressional affairs. So he's part of the group that had to inform Congress that the FBI was sort of reopening things. And John Podesta in a previous email said, he kept me out of jail once. He represented me. And so there's a tight alliance there. It just got tighter. A new email out in the last few moments. Uh, Kadzik to Podesta, May of 2015 giving him a, quote, heads up that there's an oversight hearing on the Hill today where the head of our civil division will testify, likely to get questions on State Department emails. He goes on to say the State Department just got another FOIA request, Freedom of Information. That's likely to come up in 2016. Okay, maybe this sounds like routine stuff, this heads up. But you know what? Kazik did not send it from his Justice Department email. He sent it from his Gmail to John Podesta's Gmail, as if this was offline and not going to be kept by public records. Why was this contact between justice, uh, which has been uh, obviously overseeing this FBI probe for months and months and months, even before the recent uh, events, connecting with John Podesta? Interesting. It's going to drive all this. All this technology is going to drive us back to having one-on-one -on -one conversations yeah. again. Yeah. How do you tie all these various dumps together into a story? Look, I mean, today, today yeah. what, what would be the bottom line if you were to nail that? The bottom line is there was an email yesterday where John Podesta was talking about, let's dump these, let's dump this out there as quickly as possible. Let's dump it. And some people thought he meant delete. The campaign says he was talking about getting the emails out when the New York Times story broke. Okay, fine. That may have been what John Podesta was saying as campaign chairman. But look at the timeline. The opposite happened in terms of more disclosure. The story breaks in the New York Times that she used a private account. Podesta and Mook themselves have a conversation that night where Podesta says, did you know the full extent of this? Mook, no, as, in, as if the top guys were in the dark. March 4th, they reveal the private server by the Associated Press. Uh, and Podesta uh, basically says to... Cheryl Mills, should we hold back the emails between Clinton and the president? Then Clinton gets a subpoena that same day, March 4th, uh, from Trey Gowdy on the Hill. March 5th, Philippe Reines talks about the emailer-in-chief. Clinton is in a very good place. March 7th, the president says, I learned about this from news reports. Mills, Cheryl Mills says, well, maybe not. We need to clean this up. And Reines says, there is just no good answer in one email to this server issue. March 9th, they're debating whether she has a news conference on March 10th. And Reines says, we need to focus on, quote, dropping the bomb. He later explains in the email, dropping the bomb is revealing to the public for the first time. 33,000 emails have been deleted. March 10th, Hillary Clinton has that news conference. She says, this is all fine. I did this for convenience. There was no classified information on the server. A lot of that turns out to not be true. But then the bottom line, you ask, two weeks later, the FBI, according to their original report, says roughly about March 25th, after all this back and forth, bleach fit is used to wipe out the whole, you know, wipe out the server, basically, mm -hmm. and, and the emails. What was deleted, we simply don't know. And so you look at this March of, of 2015, that was the critical time, and a lot was happening. No question. Thank you, Ed. We'll be back with you. Good okay. Nine days, we are going to win the state of Colorado, and we are going to win back the White House. We are. Donald Trump from just a few days ago, and you look at the electoral map right now, and this will really be the story come six days from now, and that's how you get to 270. This was the map from 2004 when George Bush won re-election over John Kerry. See all the red in the middle part of the country? It's just blue, really, on the outside. Watch what happens four years later when Barack Obama won the presidency, okay? You see the movement here in Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, also here in the southeast, Virginia, North Carolina, and Florida. Four years after that, just subtle changes in the map. Did you sketch that? From 2008 to 2012, it was just Indiana and just North Carolina that Mitt Romney was able to capture. Take you back to Colorado from 2004. Here's what happened. George Bush against John Kerry. In that vote that year, Bush a winner by five points. All right, you go to 2008 and watch this significant flip when Obama beat McCain by nine points. Then four years after that, he held on to it, beating uh, Mitt Romney by about five points in Colorado there. Nine electoral votes. What's the state of the race there? Here's the governor, Democrat John Hickenlooper with me now. And, sir, good day to you, and thank you. Thank you for your time. W what, do you, what do you believe is the state of the race today, first nationally? Then I'll ask you about Colorado. Well, obviously, it's tightened up a little bit nationally. Uh, uh, you can see a lot of this, uh, the FBI uh, issues that they've been releasing uh, create a, 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 you know, a, a, no, a news stream that is very distracting. But I, even nationally, I still see Hillary pretty much pretty strongly in control.
Okay, now in your state of Colorado, she has not been there a lot. Bill Clinton will be there in a matter of days. Uh, you've had at least a million votes cast already, I believe, and, and there's a large portion of your state that will vote by mail this year, larger than in years past. What are you seeing in the early returns right now that would favor Hillary Clinton or give Donald Trump an edge there? Well, you know, I think, uh, I mean, I think Donald Trump has alienated a lot of our independents and even many moderate Republicans with his attacks on women and Hispanics. And we've seen in the early vote, uh, you know, we have, as you say, over a, a million votes cast already, but the turnout, the voting by Republicans is, is much less than we've seen historically. And I think demonstrates that Hillary is going to do very well in Colorado. I think she's probably going to win it by six or eight points, maybe even ten points. Wow, that would be significant. Ten points, double figures. I mean, how, how, does, how do you square that when she's about to spend six-figure uh, six buy uh, on your state and ad, sir? Well, six-figure buy, I mean, six, that's 100000 a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, I think she's probably looking more at trying to help the down-ticket races, uh, make sure Michael Bennett running for the U.S. Senate gets support, making sure a couple of the congressional races, uh, uh, Gail Schwartz and uh, a couple of the other races that are very uh, critical here. Morgan Carroll is in, in a mm -hmm. tight race with uh, Congressman so, Coffin. So, you, so I you, think the stand saying, helps them. Yeah, you're saying that Hillary Clinton has Colorado in the bag. That's, that's what I hear. Well, I feel... No, I, w I wouldn't say that because I think we're all going to go out and work very hard over the, you know, the next six days, five and a half days to, to make sure that she does win. But I think she's got a sizable lead, and I think that's a good place to be. It doesn't mean, I mean, certainly every time I go anywhere, I, I don't see a lot of support for, for Donald Trump outside of the occasional, you know, big crowd that comes for one event. We don't see signs. We don't see a lot of indication that there's much support. You know, this is a a, a, a state like a lot of the Rocky Mountain West that is really kind of family based, family values, and that his attacking women has really rubbed people the right, wrong but, way. But you, you started this level. segment talking, Governor, about the, uh, the revelations about the FBI investigation and the WikiLeaks. And um, d give us a sense of how that is playing when, when voters get their eyes and ears on a story like that. Well, but I think it's, it, there's again and again we see this, this server. And, and certainly the server, she's apologized. She said she made a mistake. I mean, that people have heard that so many times. I don't think it's getting that much traction. And yet, you know, I mean, Donald Trump, when that videotape came out where he bragged about, in essence, what sexual assault, I mean, people are still talking about that. Okay. He also has had, what, $4 million in ads in Colorado. He spent um, a lot of I'm, money here, I'm for certain, sure. But I'm certain you've seen those in... Um... I mean, is the suggestion that a TV ad doesn't have the power anymore to persuade? Yeah, well, cer certainly there are, you know, the fragmentation of the media has meant that TV ads aren't as power powerful as they were. Uh, plus, it's a very competitive market. We have a lot of initiatives on our state constitution, uh, a lot of uh, spending on the Senate race. So, uh, you know, getting a few million dollars of TV ads is, there's an awful lot of noise out there. So he might not have gotten as much bang for his buck as you as you might well, have Bill Clinton's coming your way in two days so we'll see what happens then governor thank yeah. you for your time that's John Hickenlooper the Democratic governor of Colorado thank you sir for coming on today you bet my pleasure so Hillary Clinton reaching out to some of President Obama's strongest supporters from 2012 and courting African-American voters, tailoring her message yesterday in Florida amid signs of lower turnout by that demographic in early voting I cannot come to Sanford without talking about Trayvon Martin. Something is wrong when young people just starting their lives are dying. Something is wrong when so many parents live in fear that their child will be hurt or killed. Going to the movies, sitting in a first grade classroom, attending a Bible study. The list goes on. This has nothing to do with the Second Amendment and responsible gun owners. That was her message in Florida. I'm joined now by Ed Rollins, campaign manager for Ronald Reagan's reelection in 1984. He's also chief strategist for the Great America PAC, which is a Trump super PAC. Joe Trippi was Howard Dean's campaign manager, and he is a Fox News contributor. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Good, good to morning. have you both here. I want to get your quick take um, sort of on, on the state of the race right now. Joe, you go first. 
Uh, look, I think it's closed, obviously, but I think uh, that you still you look at the Electoral College and the states that uh, Hillary Clinton's in, uh, ahead in, and she's well over 270. Um, and so we, states like Florida, obviously, are going to be very important, but uh, uh, I, at this point still don't see any, any threat. Uh, of Trump coming up with a path to get there, but uh, we'll see on Tuesday. Yeah, so th there's a feeling, Ed, that uh, he has momentum, but she still has the numbers. What do you think? Well, I think momentum is very important in an election, and he's made dramatic strides in the last week. I mean, he's closed uh, 10, 11 points, which is historic. Uh, the, 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 those key states, the, the Floridas, the North Carolinas, the Ohios, uh, which we have to win, uh, he's doing very well in those states. Uh, and, and I think to a certain extent, uh, this is the kind of uh, election where over this weekend it's going to be very important. Uh, she certainly had nothing but negative things to deal with all week long. She can't get on the offensive. So she's not very inspiring. He Ed, really is the Ed, candidate does this change. dynamic remind you of, of 1980 or no? Sure. No, it's very definitely very much like 19, 1980 in which uh, the country did not want Jimmy Carter, but Ronald Reagan early on was an unacceptable alternative. He became an acceptable alternative in the course of the campaign. He closed very quickly after the first debate, uh, the only debate, and uh, he, he went on to have a landslide. Uh, and and I, my sense is that I, I'm not predicting a landslide, but I'm certainly predicting a win. Joe, do you agree with that? Uh, I, 